Today we are joined by Pastor Maguban who is joining us to give us some understanding on the skill, the art, the science of interpreting scripture. They in their field call it hermeneutics. So he schools us today so that perhaps we may have a better understanding of what we're doing when we go through the scriptures. Pastor Maguban, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So you're speaking to a lay person. I do not know any of your studies. We talking about hermeneutics. What is a hermeneutics? Um, hermeneutics is basically the study of interpretation. Uh, it's the art of interpretation, basically. Okay, it's the art of interpretation. Who determines whether what my interpretation is is actually art or not, or artistic? or not? Um, I would say it's basically based on uh, the tools which you perhaps have used to uh, reaching the, the conclusion of the text or the interpretation which you have now concluded after reading the text. Explain that a bit more. What tools are you referring to? Um, okay, that's a good question. Um, when you're talking about tools, especially for the benefit of the audience, um, we're not talking about shovels and, and spanners. Um, but um, when you talk about tools in the art of interpretation, you are looking at um, such things as, as language, for example. You're looking at culture, looking at the time difference. Um, and, and especially when you speak about a passage or a text that is written 2,000 years ago or even longer. And so you need to actually, the, the, we, we call them layers, which you need to actually peel through up until you try and get to the gist of the matter and, and, and stuff like that. Who came up with those tools? Um, it's not a matter of coming up with them. It's a matter of identifying them. So they pre-exist um, um, what you call hermeneutics languages there we're using it even right now um, and so we we know and understand that the bible as we have it today is has been translated from language to language so when we talk about language as a tool we're not talking about something that uh, those who are in the field had to first invent um, and then we we just found it there. it's just there uh, we simply utilize it um, yeah my question phrased differently is who made the determination that we shall use time, for example, as a hermeneutic tool? Um, I, I'd like to say it, it, is, it is us as human beings with common sense and rationale. Um, and the reason why I say that, perhaps once again for the benefit of the audience, um, what are we talking about really when we're talking about language? What are we talking about? How do we utilize these tools? Uh, perhaps uh, would be a great deal for, 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 the, um, for the audience to understand. So let me take for an example, because the thing is with hermeneutics, we, we actually deal with, we actually uh, deal with hermeneutics on a daily basis um, as, as anyone, when, when you're conversing, you have, you are actually unconsciously applying a hermeneutics because um, you're listening to a language which is English as we have it today or Zulu or whatever language you're using so you need to decode yes you need to decode that so you who is the recipient the audience will need to firstly understand the language in which the speaker is is, is, is using so that you can then decode it in your, in your mind and then understand the message itself so um, so that's basically language so when you're talking about such things as time what you are really referring to is there are different facets to time. You're looking at the, how, how, how language was used in that particular time, um, or at that particular time, rather. Um, and so what you are basically looking at, if I were to coin it and phrase it in today's language, when today in 2020, when you're talking about washing hands, and, and perhaps let's uh, move back to 2015, wash your hands before you eat wash your hands. It's the same thing that you are saying, but you're referring to two totally different things. Today, when you talk about hands or washing of hands, you, you speak under a certain context, uh, which we are finding ourselves under the corona because we know how it, it spreads, basically. And so when you talk about time, uh, you, you, when, when you are reading the text, you need to understand in which time frame 
was this text written? And during that time, what was happening? So you look at the background and all of these things, these facets that 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 are found at that time. And so we, when we talk about then who comes up with this, as I'm saying, it's it's just rationale, it's common sense. We look at things, we calculate. Okay, because this is how we operate as human beings. Therefore, when understanding the the the, the fluidity of language, how language changes over time, the usage of it, and all of those things, then it is fitting for us as interpreters of the text to then utilize this thing so, so that we unpeel all of these layers using these as tools. One of the biggest problems we have as lay people in interpreting scripture is what you as theologians would say, actually this is what this word means in Hebrew. This is what this word means in Latin or Greek or actually Jesus spoke Aramaic and you use all those tools as you just called them. Here's my question. Does that mean as a lay person because I don't know Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic, does it mean I would never be able to understand and be hermeneutically correct? Not, not, not necessarily. Not really. In fact, um, as I said, that we, in our own capacity, we deal with hermeneutics on a daily basis. Um, I believe, even um, as 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 the years have 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 been um, passing by, um, all these things they keep on evolving and we keep on bettering them, not only from people who have seen the way, but even from um, just people of God simply utilizing their intellect and their skills to 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 relook at all of these tools and refine them. Um, so you have an opportunity. I mean, even when you look at the Greek the Greek is lit. Um, the, the the New Testament is written in Greek, but the Greek which was actually used there is is common Greek, as they would say, Koine Greek. Okay, which is the common Greek which any man in the street would utilize or would speak. So 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 that it then becomes easy for this thing to to be um, communicated. So when we talk about the gospel reaching each and every man. Um, Yes, it is possible. It is very, very possible to actually utilize. I mean, uh, a lot of us have received the the gospel in our own Bibles, which we carry on a daily basis, you know, and we have been able to find Jesus Christ or find God there, and we have been, and the Spirit has impressed upon us the faith in which we have. So um, to say that um, one needs to be theologically um, astute, then um, it would be a bit improper. But then to leave it um, at that um, also would be doing an injustice. I, I guess my question, Mfundisi, is if the original language was as far flung from me as a layperson as Greek, and to exacerbate the point, while the writers of the Bible or those who translated or codified the New Testament used one language, Greek, Jesus himself spoke Aramaic, which tells me that they themselves had to take whatever Jesus was saying and translate it to a different language, which probably was Greek as we have it today because any and everyone seems to be content taking the scriptures in the New Testament being written in Greek, and yet Jesus didn't speak Greek. He spoke Aramaic. Here's my problem. I don't know Aramaic. I don't know Greek. I'm struggling with Latin because of being a, a, a person who studied law. English is another problem altogether. Is it closer? Yes. Now, I have these barriers. English, second language. Latin, third or even fourth language. Aramaic, billionth language. How do I find how do I find confidence in what I am reading if it was not even written in the language we are reading it in today? We 
we number one we have we have some form of faith in in the guys uh, who have have taken this task of interpretation or rather translation into the languages which we we, we find readily available and to our um, understanding. So we're speaking of Isi Kosa. We've got a Kosa Bible. We've got a Zulu. It's a Zulu Bible uh, for me. Uh, we've got an English Bible and different variations, um, which is another form, just by the way, for uh, the laity to, to, to actually get some form of hermeneutics, translating the different versions which we have. You know, that actually helps us out. But ultimately, to answer your point, your question directly, um, it's it's a matter of that faith in okay. Perhaps this person has articulated the text and and its meaning, the message that God intended it for 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 me um, for today. Okay, let's 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 attend to the the human aspect. First, language is a problem. Now there's an even bigger problem: the human beings. Let me identify these human beings for you so that you understand where my predicament is and the people that would have these debates in the public fora. Again, you spoke about me. I speak Isiklosa. You speak Isizulu. And we have a Bible that was translated to Isizulu and Isiklosa by somebody who claims to understand Isiklosa and hopefully understands Latin. Because that person may have, and here in comes the issue, may have taken what he's saying now in his Closa Bible from English. And the person who wrote it in English took it from the Latin Vulgate. The person who took it into and made it into Latin, wrote it into Latin, took it probably from Greek. Let's, let's assume that there is no other language between the scrolls that were found, that were then translated and codified, put together into the Latin Vulgate. So between the Vulgate, let's assume there's the Vulgate and then Latin Vulgate, Vulgate and, and then the, the, the Greek and uh, Hebrew in the Old Testament. So there are those people that we have to trust. You have to trust the one who understands this closer, who understands English, who understands Latin, who understands Hebrew, who understands Latin, uh, uh, Greek, and hopefully, those who listened to Jesus speaking Aramaic and decided they're not going to write what he's saying word for word, they will have to translate what he says. You're asking me to believe those people and the rest of these interpreters. Yes and no. Um, that is why we then have these studies that we, we, we continually have, uh, the study of ancient Greek or ancient Hebrew, these dead languages um, as you would have it today, especially when it comes to the Hebrew. Um, so as much as perhaps to put it out there, we do not, we have not yet found what we would call an autograph. Autograph is the original, original, original manuscript. So if you were Paul, if you were Moses, um, and you wrote that first copy, that initial copy that you wrote, we have not actually found that. But what we have found are photocopies, as we would have today, um, copy upon copy of the same language. Okay? Um, so to, to, to uh, make sure that the message goes across um, as they would have them during those times, those days. So as much as we do not have autographs, but we do... Um, with your archaeologist, we do discover certain manuscripts uh, that we still have even today. Uh, I had the privilege of seeing some of these scrolls, or rather copies of the scrolls, as my lecture had it uh, back in, 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 in college. Um, and, and, and the thing is that we get some form of solace in light of a predicament, is that the scrolls which we find even today, those ancient scrolls that, that um, kind of breach the gap between your Vulgate, your these other trans translations up until today's English, we do find that the way in which we have our final translation of the English, of the Isiklosa, which is most probably taken from the English, they it, 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 it does not 
um, via far off of what we have. We can still see, okay, no, we've got the essence of this. We have got the essence of this. We have got the essence of this. And therefore, then, we then are given confidence right there. And as I was talking about us, keep on um, going back to um, um, make sure that we, we, we've got an evolution of knowledge and, and, and our tools, refining these tools. What we even have today is that we have scholars your Isisulu scholars, Isitosa scholars, uh, and also biblical scholars who, who actually take their time to actually refining the Isisulu translation, which is taken from English, but actually going back and directing, um, directly translating it from the actual Greek or the actual Hebrew. I, I, I have no issue with the integrity of the text, Munis. I do have an issue with big issue with the integrity of the person it's a man like you and I we always have an agenda to say none have an agenda is is not being honest with the human nature I'll give an example a New Testament writer says I write this for you O Theophilus he writes this with an agenda so we'll talk about that later on but the fact that any and everyone writes with their agenda, and so they have this big difference in communication. They're communicating using a language that was not the original spoken language. And then they have this responsibility that we have to trust them. They have a responsibility to write using their own agenda and send it to us to read. And we have to trust that he is, well, honest. This is a man who has no ulterior motives. He will dare not change or alter the message that Jesus said when he said. So the text may be true when it is quoted verbatim, but you and I have already agreed that it is not a verbatim quote. It is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, which may have been altered through the passage of time. How do we trust people? Okay, um, I'll use this um, example, which I've, I've uh, laid on the ground for us, um, that we do have scholars that will try and translate even today. And, and, and um, the good thing about that is that we have societies um, your translation societies, if perhaps you would have it today. People, you mean? Yeah, people. other people, yes. Yeah. Um, we have things such as peer review, where more other, people. more people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have more people, um, which gives us a bit of, let's, let's remove some of Naya's agenda, propaganda within the text. Let us, let me look at it. Let this other one look at it. Let, so then we kind of have this um, openness uh, as far as it is possible uh, towards this agenda or these agendas being removed from the text. And so we have that. But how, how do these societies remove an agenda they don't know exists? For all they know, all that's written there is just that. If you and I are going to be part of a peer review mechanism for a Bible society, yes. and we're given a piece of paper, and we're told, read this, compare it to other documents that pre-exist it, see if it does tally and measure up to the standard of the others. I am dependent literally on the text on this one and on that one. We don't know what got into the writing of the text. The intentions you can never know, you only have the text. So how does a peer review of any society ever help? Because they are literally dependent on the text. They don't know the intentions behind the text. Okay, so are you talking about the um, actual original text? In, so for example, All the we, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. Um, so are you talking about that? How do we then have um, confidence in that? Yes. Or the Qumran okay. scrolls. Okay. Okay. All the scrolls you can ever that find in the various sources. How do we trust any text knowing very well yes, that yes. it is a no, product of a human being's ingenuity? But you, you will have us believe that God inspired them. Mm. Sure, he may have inspired the original writer, 
Hmm. We don't know if God inspired the ones who set and decided to put a, a comma there, a full stop there, to put a chapter one there, to put a, a verse two there. That was not inspired. That did not come from God. It was not dictated. In fact, not all of it was dictated. So again, how do we trust human beings? Okay, you've touched on inspiration, but we'll come back to that. Um, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Um, so, so for me, how I would actually look at it is number one, um, all human beings are fallible. Okay, all human beings are fallible. And that is precisely, okay, before I do the precise. Um, and as, as fallible as we are, we are dealing with something that is beyond us. Um, as one would say that the task of theology is, a, is an incomplete task. So when you're dealing with hermeneutics, dealing with something that's incomplete, especially looking at even the layers that we are talking about, all these flaws fundamentally that exist within the text and within us, um, that actually speaks to the very reason why we need to have um, this rigorous study of, of hermeneutics, knowing very well that we are not going to actually get there, there to the ultimate gem as pure as it is. That's actually reason enough why we actually need to engage and explore and eliminate each and every hurdle in our uh, path uh, and utilize all the tools to the best of our abilities um, so that we can at least knock at the door than to simply rest and say, well, because we cannot get there, then we, we, we will not uh, even attempt. But ultimately, the fundamental of, of, of hermeneutics or theology as a study is not necessarily an engagement of in intellectual exercise, but rather it is one that has a spiritual element. In fact, it, the whole agenda of, of theology and the text and everything is mainly to deal with the divine. You know, that is what we are trying to get at. We are, and, and, and when we are dealing with the divine, we are talking to people's lives. Uh, we're talking to the man in the pew at church. We're talking to the man at home listening uh, to, to an online sermon. And, and, and therefore, whenever we are engaging with this, what we are truly saying is that we are looking at saith God, or this is what the Bible says. And when it's the Bible which says this, we're talking about God is saying this um, in essence. And, and, and so as much as there's us here, um, fallible mortals, theologians, hermeneutical studies, and all of these things, ultimately we believe that the divine, the divine has to have his hand there as much as all of us are damaged goods, if I were to put it, but he, will make sure somehow that these broken vessels can still deliver the message um, one way or the other. And that is why after all of these tools, when we have used them to the best of our abilities, ultimately we, we, we firstly have to pray for them and then we pray for ourselves. It's too late to pray for them. They've already <laughs> <laughs> they've already translated it. They've already, all of these guys. It's too late now. Perhaps that's a conversation for another day. Mm -hmm. Let's let's go back to a, a point that you touched on that um, I, I've always found it rather intriguing that as ministers or religion as theologians, you're so comfortable with this. You know that you don't have the original thing. But you want us to believe it. You want us to believe it as original. You know you have a copy, mm. counterfeit, duplicate, mm. not the original thing. And knowing very well that they did not have photocopiers, which are more accurate than memory copying. How do you, how do you have confidence in something that was rewritten based on memory? Knowing very well that as human beings, are fallible beings. Mm. Our memory is less than ideal, 
and those that copied the scrolls from one to another to another to another for purposes of distribution. These are human beings. How do you expect people to trust the integrity of the text now, knowing very well that these guys were copying from memory? There are some things that they, they had to remember. Oh, that's what he says. I therefore say, right, I therefore say. And sometimes we make errors in our day and I'd love to believe that we are more advanced in terms of having pens and not just ink and feather. Here's my question. How do you trust the text you know is not the original thing? It has been copied through memory. Another good question, once again. Um, it's When you look at all of this um, that we are dealing with here, um, ultimately, we, we do not we don't believe in the paper, we do not believe in the ink, we do not believe in the writer. What we truly believe in is the one who inspires. What we believe in is God. And what we believe is that as weak as we are, God is powerful enough to make sure that his message, his message which he intends to reach Unaye, that message will reach Naye. Whatever may happen through the journey of the message to reaching Naye, we don't know, and it's not the medium in which um, um, has been used to transport the message to get to Naye, but fundamentally what we actually have faith in, it's, it's, it's not these books, these black books that we have uh, as we have them, but fundamentally, we just trust and have faith that yeah. God, you have given a message yeah. and your will is that it reaches me after 2,000 years later and we believe that God, not Matthew, not Mark, not Luke, not John, but it is God who's going to make sure that that message reaches me and it reaches me at a point where I need it and, and where I will utilize it in a way it will change my life for the better man. I, I see you're a man of faith. Let's, let's go back to this God who became man. You would have me believe that God would make sure that the message from its inspiration right down to its dispersal to me, it is not going to be contaminated. And yet he, God, Emmanuel, Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus, as you, some people call him, he comes and changes the entire thing. He says, you have heard that an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but I say. He's the one that inspired Moses to write those, right? And then he comes now when he has become incarnate into this Jewish boy named Yeshua. He comes and changes it. And you want me to believe that he is not going to change he's going to maintain the integrity and the accuracy of what is said through interpretation and yet even in his own lifetime he changes things you have heard but now i say he's the one that is changing he's the one that's confusing the whole situation how do you expect me to believe in this jesus if at one point he's going to say one thing and then later on he says oops let's change that now I say. It depends on which end of the spectrum you are looking at it from. Um, I would, perhaps, uh, from where I stand, whenever I see or hear Jesus speaking, for me it's a point of clarity. Um, it's like this. If you are going to receive a call from the president, Ramaphosa, um, and then after that you come and you um, relay that message to me and you tell me something and I will take it. I will take it as is, as you have given me. But if Ramaphosa was then to come himself and then say, oh, 
Yeah, you have heard this being said, but this is what it is now or whatever the case may be. For me, from where I'm standing, I choose to see that as, as a form of clarity, whether it, it will be a, 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 a what would term or coin um, lost in translation or what have you. I, I, I like to believe that because scripture has been talking about Jesus Christ, in fact, that is what he says, I believe in the, look of, in the book of, 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 of Luke 24, that scriptures from Moses unto the, all your prophets, they've actually been about me. And so I'd like to believe, and, 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 and yeah, I'd like to believe that therefore then with this guy, then comes clarity uh, from all the layers, the cultural norms, the, and all the social constructs that we might have prior. Uh, sounds good. Yeah. That sounds okay, prima facie, on the face of it. Because when you dig a little deeper, put aside the word clarity, which would make me comfortable if it was an actual fact clarity. In this case, Jesus doesn't clarify anything. He simply changes it. At first, you had the right to fight back. I gave you the right to fight back through Moses. Now, don't fight back. Turn the other cheek. That's not clarity. That's changing the whole story. Now, I'm supposed to be the wimp and let people beat on me and I don't defend myself. He says, turn the other cheek. And yet, at the beginning, he said, fight back. He hits you, you hit back. A tooth, a tooth. He takes your eye, you take his eye. But now he says, no, no, no. No taking of eyes now. He hits you this side, give him the other. That's not clarity, Mpunis. That's confusion. That's a God who doesn't know what he wants. Help me understand. Okay. Um, once again, we then default to our initial conversation, which is mainly about hermeneutics. Um, when you look at the text which you are quoting, um, your tooth for tooth, or, or rather your, your turn the other cheek, um, walk with um, your master for a mile longer, or whatever the text says, um, when you actually look at those texts using a different hermeneutic, because there are different hermeneutics, just by the way. When you look at those texts, they do not make the one in which Jesus is speaking to a fool like how one would see at face value or would have it at face value. Um, and, and so once again, it, it also depends on your hermeneutics when you actually read the text. Um, for an example, when you look at your eye for an eye and you look at the repercussions of it, and then after that you look at, let, if, you, if your master tells you to travel this long, go with him for this long, an extra mile. Um, depends on how you engage with these texts and how you look at the repercussions of, of all of this. One author once said, uh, an eye for an eye would leave the world blind. Um, and I believe that it, he was very much on point. Um, but when you look at, okay, you say I must travel this long, I will do you one better. Let me and you walk this much or this long, and let's do an extra one. Um, it does not necessarily speak to one who becomes just a fool, but it actually gives um, an idea that if, if you do not mind being equal to me, let us travel and I will do you even one better. I will travel even longer than what you are asking of me. And so it, it kind of puts a different spin to the text. It, it puts some form of equality to the master and the slave. Where's the equality in turning the other cheek? Once again, um, I have had the privilege of uh, sitting at the feet of someone who has done an exegesis or hermeneutics hermeneutics on that specific text. Um, 
looking at background uh, okay now i'm going to try and explain it uh, i'm going to try uh, you're the uh, theologian no I'm, i'm trying i didn't do it myself oh, well, that's that uh, i'm declaring that okay um so so the text says if 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 you slap me on the right okay on the right cheek um if one slaps you on the right cheek turn the other one so in other words give him give him the left now now um when you look at the jewish culture back in the day you have a right hand and a left hand okay so even in now you know black cultures i believe i remember when growing up we used to call the left hand isanda semfene and it's the hand that is not dominant it, it does not do anything so to say um the actual hand that's a hand of power on the right hand side okay so when you're talking about being beaten on if you're being slapped on the right on the right hand side that would suggest that one is using a left hand so that they can beat you or what they're doing is actually giving you a backhand which is using the right hand and so you backhand the person you'd not slap them like this now when one actually hits with a backhand in terms of um the understanding of the time that actually suggested um a difference in terms of um levels between the people so you are sub me and therefore i can do you anyhow in other words when you are slapping someone like that it suggests that they are much lower than you and what jesus christ is then asking is that no fight me man to man as an equal hit me like how you would hit a equal because i am your equal rather than a simple child which you just backhand um as you may want to discipline your child and so when as i'm saying uh, it 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 kind of rests on on your understanding of hermeneutics understanding of or, or which type of hermeneutics that perhaps you might also be using um but yeah all right we're just going to leave it right there on that note thank you very much we're trying to understand the interpretation of scripture you to have the right to ask your own questions find us on calvin on athol sda on twitter on facebook and on instagram as for me nayelu pondona thank you very much for this we really appreciate your time have a wonderful day and god speed thank you for watching another episode of bible answers on this platform bible answers is produced for the purposes of providing credible answers to your pressing questions using the bible as the principal source of discretion we in collaboration with the pastors that support this ministry would love to answer your questions and so post your questions on our facebook page at calvin on athol sda or send them directly to the host naye lupondona still on facebook don't forget to subscribe to our channel and support this ministry join us again next week for another episode of bible answers until then god bless and god speed Galatians 5 verse 22 which is faithfulness what is faithfulness correct faithfulness is being loyal trustworthy truthful committed to someone or to something regardless of circumstances we always try to be faithful to our parents to our friends to ourselves 
and people around us. Faithfulness can be very hard to keep. It is best to admit to God first. Matthew 6 verse 33 is telling us to put God first. God is faithful and his faithfulness is for every generation. The more we put him first, the more faithful we become. As children, we love action, right? So how do we act out our faithfulness? Hi, Mangi. Hi, friend. He took the sweet. Ish. Hi, friend. Look. Ah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sure. To be faithful, even in small things. I wanted to keep his sweet. However, I chose to remain faithful and I gave it back to him. The beauty of this act is God is working in us and through us. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, please help us boys and girls to be always faithful to you and to everyone so that we may enter the kingdom. You have prepared for us. Amen. Remain faithful. And all to him, to him I owe. He is my, my sin. He left a crimson stain. Oh, but he washed it white. He washed it white as snow. We are reading from the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3, and we are going to read verse 17 and uh, 18. It reads as follows. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall, fall, shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the, from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. We know we have been having so many challenges which are affecting our lives. But in spite of all these challenges, the Lord is still there. And what is it that can separate us from the love of the Lord? None of these things can separate us from the love of God. And therefore, wherever we are and whatever we do, let us always remember that challenges will come, but the Lord is always there for us. We might not be having anything in our pockets, but still, in spite of all that, the Lord still takes care of us. And therefore, as we are going to give our offerings and tithes, let us remember that we are just stewards. Even the life that we have belongs to God. Let us kneel down as we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we would like to thank you, Lord, for the gift of life that you have bestowed upon us. Not that we are worthy to have it, but it is because of your love and mercy. 
And Lord, we pray that in everything that we do, may you take center stage. All the plans that we have, may they be the plans that fit in the master plan that you have for us. On our own, there is nothing that we can do. Help us to depend upon you all the days of our lives. We have women and children who are experiencing a lot of excruciating pain because of what is happening. But Lord, I pray that as a church, may we desist from that. May we depend upon you for, our, for your guidance. And may you be our light and we follow thee. Lord, the offerings that are going to be collected, may they be worthy in thy sight. We know that there is a lot of work that needs to be done. And Lord, may we be part and parcel and be co-workers with you in this vineyard. The harvest is plenty, but the reapers are few. Help us, Lord, to say we are here. Send us so that we can do the, the work. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. to all of you in the name of Jesus. We are grateful to the Lord that he has been able to keep us throughout the week in our homes and wherever we have been so that we are able to reach yet another Sabbath in his grace. It is indeed has been a very wonderful week and we are grateful to the Lord that we are able to have an opportunity to listen to his word. I'm going to be asking you to join me as we read together in the scriptures from the book of Exodus chapter 33 reading from verse 18 right through to 23. I will be reading in your hearing. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked. I've started from verse 17. Because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Verse 18. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face. You cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Verse 21, then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock when my glory passes by. I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Let us close our eyes for a word of prayer. Father, we have heard from your word. Now we ask that you may make it relevant to our lives and we also request a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. 
The book of Exodus chapter 33 uh, provides for us what in theology we refer to as the hapax legomena. That is a word or phrase that has only been used once in the entire scripture. The request that Moses is making to God becomes our theme for this presentation. Lord, show me your glory. Someone can actually make it their prayer. Lord, please show me your glory. And when you read the entire Bible, right from Genesis to Revelation, you will not find this phrase uttered in the similar way in, like Moses is making the same to God, asking to see the glory of God. The Bible is interesting in that when you were to look at the conversation of Moses and God, even before he utters uh, the request that he makes, it is sort of like he is manipulating God by saying to God, how will people know that I am favored of you? How will I know? How can I prove to myself as Moses that there is something special between me and you, God? Then it is the Lord who says in verse 17, it is okay, Moses, let me do the thing you ask. And this is what Moses asks. Lord, show me your glory. What a request. Many of us in our lives come to a point when we want to know where does God stand in relation to our situation. Many a times we come to a time like Moses where we want to understand where does God stand? What is it that God can do to prove to ourselves or to me that I am favored of him? What proof can I present to those who are around me, to the world and everywhere else that I belong with God, I belong to God, that me and God have a relationship. And thus when God engages with Moses, he then agrees to give to grant such a deep request and the request comes being Lord show me your glory. I need us to look at other principles of understanding scripture. It is true that God knows everything. In fact our lives to God are a simple history. Everything that we are doing God has seen it until the very end such that even when we come to a point of need that we need confirmation and affirmation of God's presence in our lives, the Bible assures us that God has already seen this. When you look at this conversation of Moses and God, you get a sense that there are other things that are deep in the heart of Moses that lead him to such a very profound and intimate request of seeing the glory of God. In other Bible translations, the Bible writers, or rather those who are translating the Bible, present this, the phrase as, Lord, show me your face. Now that becomes a bit tricky when you read other Bible texts like Exodus 16, Exodus 23, and a number of Bible texts that are referring to the glory of God. Because it was not the first time where God had allowed people to see his glory in other instances. But it was the first time when a person, an individual, personalizes this in this request and they are making it their own, owning it as in God, show me myself your glory. And Moses makes this request. But when you look into the book of Numbers, you find that there is an account where God himself speaks about his relationship with Moses. I want to begin by drawing a picture about God and Moses. The two have had a very beautiful relationship. One that even allows one to come and make such a difficult request. Friends, it is when we are nurturing a relationship that other things are becoming easier to do or to share with someone. And what we find in Exodus 33 is exactly that. When Moses and God's relationship matures to a particular level, there are certain requests that no, no matter how deep or profound they may be, are now possible because of that relationship. I would like to encourage us therefore to be those who seek to mature our relationship with God so that we may grow to a point and a position where we can ask certain things that may be difficult for us to ask but that are possible simply because our relationship has matured to that point. 
Another thing I would like to point out is that God himself is proud of his relationship with Moses to the point that in the book of Numbers, it is God who says, when I speak to Moses, I speak to him face to face. Did I hear that? And that is what the Bible says, that it is God who says, when I speak to Moses, I speak to him face to face. This is when he is chastening and rebuking people for mistreating and ill-treating Moses. He is saying to them, when I speak to other prophets and uh, those I sent out with a message, I use dreams and visions. But when it comes to Moses specifically, I speak to him face to face. This is now God bragging or showing off that when it comes to Moses, there is a relationship that we share that allows us to do certain things that I, God, do not do with other people. Now, it is not the first time we hear about Moses and God seeking to speak face to face. What I therefore gather about Exodus 33, that becomes different with other phrases a Bible text that record that Moses has been speaking to God face to face is that this time around it is when there is a challenge in Israel and Moses as the leader put by God is frustrated but when you begin from the preceding verses of chapter 33 it will tell you how God himself at some point had said I am done and tired of Israel from here onwards you go by yourself I will not go with you and it is Moses who then goes to God and says wait a minute I don't have Israel I do not have position of your people Israel is about you. This journey that we have started from Egypt to Canaan is all about you. I am appointed of you to do this work. If you stop and not proceed with us, who then must do the same? For all that we are doing is all about you. And in those claims that Moses makes, it is then when Moses says, beyond the claims I am making to you as God to continue moving with us. For friends, it is true. This is the most dangerous thing any of us can ever do to walk through life without God. If there is anyone who is unsafe, it is anyone who is vulnerable, it is an individual or person, a family or congregation that moves without God. With that understanding, therefore, Moses seeks an affirmation of God's presence in his life by saying, beyond your agreeing, your change of mind and heart that you will now proceed with us. For the Bible does say that God said, it's okay, I will continue to work with you. Then Moses says, as an individual and as a leader, I now want to see more than what you are showing all of us. Friends, there need to be a time that when we relate to God, we remember ourselves apart from those we lead, apart from those that we are working with, apart from those who are surrounding us. Everyone, when it comes to God, you need to find your own time to be to, to own God, your own time to be proud of God, your own gifts of faith, things that you claim from God, that when you have them, they will affirm your faith, strengthen your walk with God, and ensure that you continue a smooth walk with God. Then God decides to grant this. But I need us to clarify something. When Moses says, I would like to see your face, and the Bible also says that he does speak to God face to face, what does it mean? Does it actually mean that when Moses is actually looking at God's face, he's then he is asking, I would like to see your face? While he is looking at the face of God, he then requests to see that which he is looking at. I would like to propose to you that both these texts are not in contradiction whatsoever. For it is true that when you have seen the face of God, it is addictive, beautiful, and attractive that anyone who has seen the face of God want to see more of his face. Looking at the face of God is enough for that particular time but there are times that as we are going through life what we have seen of God cannot carry us on we need to see the face of God again so that even when one has seen the face of God one cannot say this is all if you have seen the face of God then you know that there are things 
that happen in your life that you cannot do by yourself. You need another view at Jesus' face. You need another view at the face of God. It is in that idea that Moses says, even though I could have seen your face, today I need something fresh about the very thing that I have seen. Hence, Jesus teaches us to pray. And in the prayer, he says, we need to ask God for a daily dose of his blessings or provision because one is not enough. We need to have a constant encounter. We need to keep on coming to the well of drinking water. We need to always bask in the presence of God for his provision for even our daily bread. In that Moses continues bravely so to say, Lord, I want to see your face. What is interesting, therefore, is that God is willing to grant even such a difficult request. Why? With prayer, God is able to provide even the normal things that we think are impossible. It is the, it is the Bible that says to us, that asks, what is impossible with God? For what is difficult with men? With God, it is not impossible. God is able to grant to us, to give to us as we faithfully ask him in prayer. And God is able to even give to us a lot of those portions of things that we are asking for. And Moses beckons God, I would like to see your face. Then God sets parameters. Moses, while face to face in their conversation, Moses, as you are looking at my face, you should know by now that I don't show my face. <laughs> While I am, you are looking at me and we are speaking face to face, it should be common knowledge to you that I don't show people my face. And thus the Bible continues to say, then God makes the following statement. That should be the key to understanding the relationship of prayer and the things that we may think are bad from God. God says, I will grant mercy to who, the one I will show mercy. I will give compassion to the one I will give compassion. Meaning, God gives mercy and compassion to whomever he chooses. If there are any boundaries that could could have been set in your life if there is an allocation of blessings that has been closed out to you if there were things that were said that they are out of bounds when it comes to you this text simply means god can give mercy to whoever he wishes to give mercy god is able to give compassion to whoever he gives compassion loosely speaking and humanly speaking this phrase should be understood as god saying i can break my own rules if I need to honor a bigger rule of answering a prayer. When a, 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 when a believer beckons God for something, God is able to break his own rules in order to, to grant other rules a proper reply. And thus he says to Moses, even though my face is not what I give to you, I will do something. But again, look at how God decides to do this. He says to Moses, I will not show you my face, but I will show you my back. But when you see these things, it will be enough as one who has seen my face. <laughs> this teaches us about what it means when we pray. When we pray to God, you must have heard that. God is not hearing our prayers in ways that we are uttering, but the one who reads our hearts listens to the needs of the heart. And that is why when God answers our prayers, it is not necessarily more of words, but to the desires of our hearts. And here God says to Moses, I will not grant you according to your words of seeing my face. I will grant you to your heart's wishes to affirm my relationship with you. Now, we, when we draw to the end, you find the four-step program that God gives to Moses. He says, this is what we can do so that you are able to see my face. Number one, God says, you will need to stand on a rock. You see, Moses, there comes a time, some things for you to see, you need to be properly positioned. 
The first thing we find here is that God says, Moses, you need to position yourself properly. For the request you are making is not one of boys, it's one that is made by men. So if you need to go with me to receive what you are asking for, you better position yourself. And it is God who says, I need you to stand on a rock. And when you are standing on a rock, hide in that rock. While you are hiding in that rock, it is I, God, who will, who will cover your face with my hand. I will close your eyes with my hand. And when I do so, I will pass on my back and then you will see that which you are asking for. What is it that God, therefore, is saying to Moses? Number one, position yourself by standing on a rock and hide on the rock. We know this rock is Jesus. There is nothing of God we can see or experience when we are not firmly grounded in Jesus. Haven't you heard that the blessings of God can be caused for us to move away from God? Therefore, for us to receive some things, we, it needs to be clear. It must not be questions where we stand with God because we should be firmly standing on the rock that is Jesus Christ. Hiding ourselves behind the rock. Simply put, God is saying, if you need to see me, you need to hide yourself. Nothing of you must show. I need to see nothing of you so that you can see more of me. Friends, none of us can see God when we are still full of self. None of us can have a sight of God when we are full of ourselves, when we are conscious of who we are, when we still remember our bank accounts, our positions, our education, our influence and contribution, all these things are temporal. Those of us who seek to see God need to be willing to be hiding ourselves so that nothing of ourselves shows and all of God can show. That way we are able to see the face of God. And, and, Moses, and God further says, I will then, Moses, I will then close your eyes so that I am able so that you are able to see me. I will cover you with my hand. You see, my friend, I understand the need that Moses has, but I also understand what God says. We human beings, when God says, close your eyes or use your hand to close your eyes, like Moses, we would have been tempted, my friends. We would have been tempted to close our eyes when we are trying to see at the same time. And God says, let me not tempt you by allowing this to do it yourself. Let me do it for you. Let me cover your hand. Friends, are you aware that with our naked eyes, we cannot see God? Are you aware that with ourselves, with who, all of what we have, with the experience we gather, with all that we have seen, it is not enough to see God. In fact, that's why when we pray, we need to put a curtain of closing our eyes. For it is in the closing of eyes that we see better, we see far, we see further than that, what, that which God is showing us than when we are watching with our own eyes. And in this God commits, I will cover your eyes. With my hand, the very hand that wrote in Babylon, Mene Mene Tekel Ufasin, the very hand that made the Ark of Noah safe, the very hand of God, the one that saved a woman caught in an act of adultery, that rode on the ground, and men with all their anger, hatred, agenda, and all malice that they had brought, they ran away when that hand wrote on the ground. With that very hand, God says, Let me cover your eyes so that you are able to see me. You can't see God without God. Friends, I'm trying to say to you, none of us can see God without God. It is God who leads us in all he is. None of us can see him if he does not show himself or allow us to see him. And God says, you want to see me? Let's do it my way. Friends, we have been singing this chorus since we were young. There is no way, and I will transliterate it for you. There is no way that leads to heaven. That moves where we want. We need to use God's way. We need to walk and be led by God's spirit. It needs to be God who guides our paths. For his way is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Only that way we can see God. And the last thing he says to him, he says, I will pass. <laughs> Friends, God gives Moses a program 
of seeing him. And I enjoy the last step. He says, I will pass with my back. But passing with my back, when you are hiding already behind the rock, when your eyes have already been covered with an eternal hand, still God says, I will not risk it by giving you my face. I will pass with my back. It is only Ezekiel who tells us in chapter 1 and he says, I looked at the one who seated on the throne of God. It's like he looks like a wheel in a wheel. It's like he's got eyes all over such that even when God is passing on his back, Moses cannot say, I did not see your face. For any portion of God around you is enough to have seen the face of God. And that's when God does this, he says, that covers that which you are asking for. There is somebody today who's got a need in their life to be affirmed by God and perhaps you are making this prayer, Lord I would like to see your face. You've got a need in your life. Perhaps you have been singing, you have been preaching, you have been walking with God but like Moses you got to a point in your life where history is not enough to take you to the future. Then like Moses, you say, even though I could have seen your face before, I would like to see it once more. Another writer says, a look at the face of Jesus makes all things disappear. It is the favorite hymn I like in the Christ in song, where the songwriter says in verse 2, when I looked at the Savior and he smiled at me, earth and all its problems vanished away for then I realized that there is life by looking at Jesus Christ friends whatever desperation you are at today whatever challenge you may be experiencing whatever sickness that could be in your blood whatever stress you may be carrying in your mind a look at Jesus makes things go away keep on looking at Jesus he will make a difference for you but as I close, I would like to remind you, with all that God has done, I suspect you should have seen the face of God by now. If the disease you carry in your blood, others have been buried for the same and you are still alive, surely you have seen the face of God. If you are the only one who survived that car accident that claims people's lives and you walked out without a scratch, surely you must have seen the side of God. Surely if it is you who is able to pay for their bills at school, if it is you whom God was able to mold when your marriage had fallen into pieces and your broken pieces had no one to put together except God who is a mender of human beings and you are able to even stand and praise his name today, definitely you must have seen the face of God. I'd like to ask, I would like to request you that while you are searching for God's face, don't forget that the one who led us in the past continues to lead us into the future. I would like to pray with somebody today who says, Lord, show me your glory. I would like to pray with somebody who says, Lord, make a difference in my life. I would like to pray with somebody who says, another look at Jesus should be able to make things better. If you are there, why don't you stand and let us pray together. If you are there, why don't you raise your hand wherever you are. Let's pray together. If you are there, why don't you give God a chance right now so that you have another new experience of the glory of God. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your loving kindness. We are even grateful for yet another opportunity to allow us to see the face of God. We are grateful, Heavenly Father, for some of us just realize we have just been looking for that which you've already provided. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Father, we are grateful that we still have something to eat because your face has been shining on us. We are grateful, Heavenly Father, we, we come to worship and we listen to you with clothes on our back for already you have shown us your glory. But tonight... This afternoon or today, whatever it is that is going through our lives, we want to present ourselves and saying, Father, yet another look at your face should make us better. We ask, Heavenly Father, that this request may become our continuous life, that we spend time looking at your face. Please grant this prayer in the name of Jesus we ask. Amen. <laughs>